Good morning. The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee's mission statement reads as follows. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Today's hearing falls exactly within our mission statement and is, in fact, the heart of our statement. Bureaucratic accountability is, in fact, a growing problem in America at a time in which we would hope that data transparency, websites that can be automatically populated with information day in and day out so that the Americans can seamlessly search for information they have a right to know should be a given. But it is the exception, the rare exception. FOIA authority needs to be expanded, but let me assure you, FOIA needs to be nearly obsolete, obsolete because, in fact, most information requested and seldom properly granted should, in fact, be available online in real time. To do this, this committee will have to work with this and future administrations to break down the silos that have for so long caused the closing even of financial information to be done generally by tens or hundreds of bureaucrats retyping and re-inputting data or data centers manipulating data from divergent databases. Today, though, we will hear about the President's issued executive order directing Federal agencies to disclose more information and disclose it more rapidly and to reduce the backlog. For this, we commend the President. Just this week, John Podesta, the man who managed the President's transition team, stated his disappointment in how the administration has thus far implemented FOIA procedures. Indeed, transparency is often the victim of electoral success. Every inspiring presidential candidate promises voters to inaugurate a new era of open government upon his election. But nearly every administration, and if this hadn't been written for me, I might have just said every administration, proceeds to delay redact or deny FOIA request when public disclosure of information is deemed politically inconvenient. The Committee has initiated a comprehensive analysis of how Federal governments handle FOIA procedures. <coughs> In recent weeks, the Committee has witnessed firsthand the bureaucratic obstruction that the general public often experiences. The committee experienced to date reveals inadequacies in FOIA as well as a disparity in FOIA compliance among Federal agencies. Today's hearing will afford the committee an opportunity to fully examine some of the problems associated with FOIA design and implementation, as well as executive branch compliance. I look forward to the, uh, the witnesses today. And in closing, before I recognize the ranking member, I also would like to thank the men and women who do FOIA compliance. As much as today's hearing may be about delays and bureaucratic ineptness, there are hundreds upon hundreds of people whose job every day it is to try to work within a system that they did not create, rules that they must comply with, and frustrations when, in fact, people are complaining they didn't get what they asked for, they didn't get it at all or they didn't get it in a timely fashion. So let, from this committee, which represents, uh, if you will, the, the rights of every Federal worker, let us understand today it is not about blaming those in the FOIA compliance. It is about blaming those of us well above them who have an obligation to make the system work so they can do their job better. With that, I recognize the uh, ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing. I want to start off where you ended up. Um, so often, our public employees are so many negative things are said about them. It's very good 
to hear you, Mr. Chairman, feel, as I do, that public employees play a very, very important role. They are often unseen, unnoticed, unappreciated, and unapplauded. And so I take this moment to uh, join with you in thanking not only uh, the four-year employees, but all of our public employees who, uh, uh, contrary to so many statements that we have heard, are quite often underpaid and, um, and dedicate their lives to making a difference. This is Sunshine Week, Mr. Chairman, our Nation's observance of the importance of open and transparent government. This week also marks the 260th anniversary of James Madison's birth. He was a champion of the public's right to know and a strong defender of open government. In 1822, James Madison said, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power the, the power knowledge gives. So it is fitting today that our committee is holding a hearing on one of the pillars of open government, the Freedom of Information Act, which helps ensure that the public has the information and the knowledge that Madison described so powerfully. President Obama, beginning on his first day in office, has reinvigorated the executive branch's commitment to open government and reversed many of the troubling policies of his predecessor, highlighting FOIA as, quote, the most prominent expression of a profound national commitment to ensuring an open government. The President said this, the Freedom of Information Act should be administered with a clear presumption in, in the face of doubt, openness prevails. Based on this instruction, Attorney General Eric Holder rescinded Attorney General Ashcroft's 2001 policy a memorandum on FOIA that allowed agencies to err on the side of secrecy rather than disclosure for eight long years. The Obama administration's new commitment to transparency and open government has resulted in significant improvements in FOIA implementation. FOIA backlogs have been reduced significantly uh, in, in back to back years under this administration. Agencies such as the Departments of Agriculture and Defense have decreased incoming requests by proactively disclosing more information online. And the Department of Justice recently unveiled FOIA.gov, a comprehensive public resource for government wide FOIA information and data. Still, there is always room for improvement. Still, we can always do better. A, re a recent report from the National Security Archive found that the Obama administration has clearly stated a new policy direction for open government, but has not conquered the challenge of communicating and enforcing that message throughout the executive branch. In my opinion, the best way to make government more effective is to make it more accountable to the public. For this reason, I am pleased to announce that I have introduced legislation this morning to strengthen the Nation's core open government laws, and every Democratic member of our committee is an original co-sponsor. This legislation, the Transparency and Openness in Government Act, is a package of five bills that overwhelmingly passed the House last Congress with broad bipartisan support, including your own, Mr. Chairman, and this legislation will do the following make Federal commissions more transparent and accountable, increase public access to Presidential records, require greater disclosure of donations to Presidential libraries, ensure that government email records are preserved, and clarify the authority of the Government Accountability Office to access agency records. Mr. Chairman, I know you believe that transparency should not be a partisan issue. I heard what you just said, and I know you mean it. So I hope that you will join as a co-sponsor, too, as chairman of this committee and chairman of the House Transparency Caucus, and as a supporter of identical language that, that last uh, Congress, that passed last Congress, I know you share our goals. Given the widespread bipartisan support of these provisions, I hope that you and every single Republican and every single Democrat in the House uh, will join us in making sure that we sign on to this bill and urging Speaker Boehner to move it to the House floor as swiftly as possible. And with that, Mr. Chairman, again, I thank you for this uh, hearing, and I look forward to the testimony, and I thank the witnesses uh, for being with us today. With that, I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member. Members may have seven 
uh, days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. The Chair will now recognize the panel of witnesses. <clears throat> Ms. Uh, Nisbets, has got that right finally, is the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, which acts as a FOIA ombudsman between requesters and agencies. Professor Daniel uh, Metcalf is the Executive Director, uh, the Director of the Collaboration of Government Secrecies through American uh, Un Universities, Washington College of Law, and a former Director of the Office of Information and Privacy at the Department of Justice. Mr. Rick Blum is the Coordinator for Sunshine in Government Initiative and has spent over a decade in Washington advocating for greater transparency in government. Tom Fitton is the President of Judicial Watch, a conservative nonprofit uh, whose mission is, is to promote transparency and accountability in government, and uh, we are very familiar with your work also. And uh, Ms. Angela Canterbury is the Director of Public Policy at the Project on Open Government, otherwise known as POGO which is focused on achieving effective, accountable, and open ethical government. And again, we thank you for your work. It is the rule of the committee that all witnesses be sworn. If you would please rise to take the oath. Raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate all have uh, answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. I would inform the entire panel that, contrary to our ordinary procedure, since this is the last day before a recess, uh, votes will be held sometime during this hearing. There will only be two votes. We will stay for at least five minutes, perhaps as much as ten, uh, if you are still making your statements. We will leave. There will be two votes. We should be back in 20, 25 minutes after we leave. Uh, I would announce that as soon as anyone returns that can take the chair, we will commence so that we not interrupt. We will also take members uh, who come back in the order in which uh, they come if there is uh, uh, time. And uh, I will now, for five minutes, you, you, most of you have been here a lot. You know the drill, uh, green, yellow, red. Let us get through all of you, if we can, before the votes. Ms. Nibbets. <clears throat> Nisbet. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Representative Cummings, and members of the committee. Uh, I am delighted to be here today during Sunshine Week to talk about uh, my office, the Office of Government Information Services at the National Archives and Records Administration. We are an important part of the Freedom of Information and the Open Government Initiatives of the Federal Government. And we are also a new approach under the FOIA to avoiding litigation. As you know, the FOIA is pretty simple in concept, but a bit more complicated in execution. Anyone can ask for records of the executive branch agencies, which then, within strict time limits, must respond to the requester either disclosing the records or giving the reasons why they are not being disclosed under specific exemptions. If dissatisfied, the requester can file an administrative appeal within the agency and then, if still unhappy, file a lawsuit in Federal court. At least that was the law until the FOIA was amended in 2007 to create the Office of Government Information Services, or OGIS as we call it to offer mediation services to resolve disputes between FOIA requesters and the executive branch agencies. In addition to resolving disputes, the statute directs us to review agency FOIA policy, procedure, procedures, and compliance. In carrying out our mission, we have realized that much of our work does fall under the designation that Congress gave us as the FOIA Ombudsman. As an ombudsman, OGIS acts as a confidential and informal information resource, communications channel, and complaint handler. OGIS supports and advocates for the FOIA process and does not champion requesters over agencies or vice versa. We encourage a more collaborative, accessible FOIA for everyone. 
At this hearing, looking at, among other things, crowdsourcing of FOIA oversight, you will be glad to hear that the interest in FOIA reaches far and wide based on what we have seen in our first 18 months of operation. We heard from requesters from 43 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and 12 foreign countries. Our cases have involved 32 departments and agencies, including all 15 Cabinet-level departments. We answered questions, provided information, listened to complaints, and tried to help in any way we could. For the more substantive disputes, we facilitated discussions between the parties, both over the phone and in person, and worked to help them find mutually acceptable solutions. The statutory term mediation services includes the following, formal mediation, facilitation, and ombud services. We have found that the less formal method of facilitation by OGIS staff members provides something similar to mediation, but, as I said, in a less formal way, and parties are more willing to engage with OGIS and with each other without the perceived formality of mediation. Since September 2009, when we opened, <clears throat> OGIS has closed 541 cases, 124 of them true disputes between FOIA requesters and agencies, such as fees charged and FOIA exemptions as applied. As a facilitator for the FOIA process to work as it is intended, we were not calling balls and strikes, but letting the parties try to work matters through with our assistance in an effort to avoid litigation. In three-quarters of the disputes we handled, we believe that the parties walked away satisfied and that OGIS helped them to resolve their disputes. And you can read about those cases in our public case log, which is posted on our website. <clears throat> a realization we quickly faced is that defining success is a challenge. The final result of our process is not both parties getting exactly what they want, sometimes not even close. But if we are able to help them in some way by providing more information or by helping them understand the other party's interest, we feel that we have provided a valuable service. When OGIS first set out, we spoke of changing a culture or mindset from one of reacting to a dispute in an adversarial setting to one of actively managing conflict in a neutral setting. OGIS has a unique perspective on the way FOIA works. We work side by side with FOIA professionals and the agencies to improve the process from within, and we also work closely with requesters on the outside to address shortcomings. We have seen the importance of building relationships and trust among the members of the FOIA community. It is an exciting process. We have just gotten started, but we are pleased to see so many positive results in a short time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Metcalf. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. As someone who has worked with the Freedom of Information Act for almost 35 years now, I am pleased to be here to provide an academic perspective on the Act and its government-wide administration. My own views today are rooted in my work at American University's Washington College of Law in recent years, where I teach courses in government information law and direct the Collaboration on Government Secrecy, or CGS for short. CGS came into existence in 2007 as the first academic center at any law school in the world to focus on this subject area. In addition to maintaining an extensive website as an academic resource for all those who are interested in government secrecy and transparency as two sides of the same coin, we have conducted a dozen day-long programs on the subject with particularly heavy info, uh, focus on the FOIA. This academic perspective is also informed by decades of experience in leading the component of the Department of Justice that discharges the Attorney General's responsibility to guide all agencies of the executive branch on the complexities of the FOIA's administration. I know firsthand both the difficulties to Federal agencies that FOIA requests can pose and the challenges met in encouraging proper compliance with the Act, including new policy conformity by all agencies notwithstanding those difficulties. So it is through that lens that I view the many ways in which the openness in government community has been disappointed by the surprising slowness and incompleteness of the Obama administration's new FOIA policy implementation during these past two years. This began with the Holder FOIA memorandum itself, quickly issued as it was. Contrary to all expectations and despite the precedent established by Attorney General Janet Reno not long before, 
the hold of FOIA memorandum did not, by its terms, apply its new foreseeable harm standard to all pending litigation cases where it could have had an immediate, highly consequential impact. Rather, it contained a series of lawyerly hedges that appear to have effectively insulated pending cases from it. As one of the speakers at CGS's FOIA Community Conference in January pointedly observed, the FOIA requester community is still waiting to see a list of any litigation cases in which the foreseeable harm standard has been applied to yield greater disclosure. And there is a very strong suspicion that there are few at best and perhaps even no such cases. Thus, the best possible opportunity to press for full adoption of the standard throughout the executive branch in a concrete, exemplary fashion was lost. Neither did the Holder FOIA memorandum or its initial implementation guidance take the expected step of directing agencies to reduce their backlogs of pending FOIA cases. Whereas the Reno FOIA memorandum and its implementing guidance had immediately confronted that difficult subject, their, 19, pardon me, their 2009 counterparts contained hardly a word about it, let alone a direction to reduce any backlog. That did not come until the broader Open Government Directive was issued in December 2009. This led to the Department of Justice straining at this time last year to claim government-wide backlog reduction progress based upon new annual report statistics that hardly could be connected to what the Obama administration actually had done. This remains a matter of concern today for more than one reason. First, there is the awkward fact that the Justice Department's own FOIA backlog has not been reduced in the past year. Rather, it has been allowed to worsen. When the lead government agency for the FOIA fails in its entirety to reduce its own backlog, it makes it much harder to press other departments and agencies to do so. And this do as I say, not as I do problem is exacerbated by the fact that the Department's high visibility leadership offices, the offices of Attorney General, Deputy Attorney General and Associate Attorney General, saw their own numbers of pending requests increase in this past year by an aggregate figure of nearly 33 percent. This makes it impossible to lead by example. Turning to the FOIA's exemptions, the one that cries out for immediate attention is, of course, Exemption 2. This is because Federal agencies have been for nearly three decades using the so-called high 2 aspect of the exemption to withhold sensitive information, the disclosure of which could reasonably be expected to enable someone to circumvent the law, especially in a post-9-11 context. Ten days ago, however, the Supreme Court firmly ruled in Milner Department of Navy that this longstanding interpretation of Exemption 2 is incorrect. As of that date, HI-2 simply ceased to exist. This means that the large amounts of information that agencies have regularly withheld under Exemption 2 alone are no longer properly withheld on that basis, and it places agencies in an immediate quandary over how to handle sensitive such information, both at the administrative level and in FOIA cases pending in court. I think. Uh, the summary of the position with respect to Exemption 2, uh, just in the interest of time, is that this committee does need to address it with nothing less than a wholesale rewrite of, ex of the exemption carefully contoured to protect security sensitive information with a firm harm standard. In conclusion, I also want to mention something briefly about Exemption 3, because I think the committee will also want to pay attention to that. I know it struggles with proposed new Exemption 3 statutes uh, that it tries to flag for attention, but there is also the matter of the existing Exemption 3 statutes. This past year, CGS conducted an academic study of this subject by first compiling a list of the statutes invoked, more than 300 of them, and in summary, we found that nearly half of them were not properly qualified to be invoked as Exemption 3 statutes. The committee could take this groundwork, if it chooses, and build upon it simply by asking each agency that reports using a questionable statute under Exemption 3 to look into why and how it is doing so. I dare say that if the committee were to take such a step, it would at a minimum result in dozens of agencies realizing that many dozens of the statutes they now regularly use are not truly Exemption 3 statutes at all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blum. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. I coordinate the Sunshine in Government Initiative, a coalition of media groups dedicated to promoting transparency and accountability in government. FOIA is a vital tool to identify problems in government and society. Because of FOIA, the public learned that beef in school lunches has been held to a lower safety standard than meat supplied to adults. 
and firefighter safety equipment would not work well at high temperatures or when wet. And yet, journalists comprise only about 6 percent of all FOIA requests. Why? There are several reasons, none surprising. Long delays and backlogs that persist in every administration, no matter which party controls the White House. Few consequences for agencies improperly denying or in delaying requests. And most journalists simply don't have the luxury to wait or fight bureaucratic battles. They move on to the next story. The most successful FOIA filers are the most organized and patient. And despite some improvements from the President's transparency efforts, reporters filing FOIA requests are seeing little improvement on the ground. I would like to focus my comments on the cost of FOIA, troublesome statutory exemptions to FOIA under Exemption 3, as Dan has mentioned, and the use of technology to, to better manage the FOIA process. First, the cost of FOIA. The government is spending more money on the FOIA process. Federal spending on FOIA is up 35 percent in two years. In 2010, agencies reported spending nearly $400 million to process FOIA requests. At the same time, the investment in FOIA can save taxpayer dollars by shining a light on what government is doing. Let me give an example. The Washington Post tied good reporting with FOIA to show that farm subsidy payments meant as a safety net for struggling farmers were going to wealthy farmers and suburbanites. Proposed reforms to the subsidy program would save taxpayers an estimated $228 million in the first year and $2.5 billion over 10 years. We have no position on farm subsidies. But it is worth noting these changes would pay for the most of the government's FOIA expenses, and that is just one set of FOIA requests. Let me also address statutory B-3 exemptions. These are exemptions that are written into the law. These undermine FOIA's presumption of disclosure. Our coalition spends considerable resources fighting defensively against the worst of these proposed exemptions. We looked at agency reports over the last decade to count how many statutes there are, similar to what Dan did. We found, when you eliminate duplicates, that Federal agencies cited at least 240 different statutes, it may be over 300, in denying FOIA requests. So for Sunshine Week, ProPublica, a nonprofit investigative journalism center, created, took our data and created an easily searchable <coughs> online database of these exemptions and launched it this week. Why protect the identities of honeybee handlers or watermelon growers or certain pygmy owls at, particular, at a particular national park? or, more significantly, losing contract bids submitted through competitive bids for Federal contracts. Separate B-3 statutes bar the disclosure of all these things. Our hope is to learn from readers when these exemptions are used and when they are abused. We are crowdsourcing oversight of FOIA. Mr. Chairman, the provision in the Dodd-Frank financial reform law that you successfully opposed with others was just one of these B-3 exemptions. Let me suggest several steps to better limit Exemption 3 statutes. First, in the House, this committee should receive limited referral of the particular provisions uh, within legislation that affect FOIA, including Exemption 3 statutes. Second, in its regular review of legislation, the Office of Management and Budget could evaluate an agency's proposed B3 exemptions when they are proposed. And third, any author, sponsor or reviewer should first assess whether existing exemptions would suffice without a new uh, exemption, or the proposed exemption is justified, or any foreseeable harm resulting from disclosure is greater than the public benefit from disclosure. The statute is narrow in scope, what is proposed is narrow in scope and specific, and that there is adequate public notice so we can have an open debate about these. These steps would go a long way to avoid cutting overbroad or unnecessary holes into FOIA. Let me turn finally to the use of technology to better track FOIA requests responses in agency performance. For the public to help improve FOIA, the FOIA process itself should be more transparent. We see OGIS as an important part of this, and they are already helping to clarify the process for requesters and provide best practices for agencies. At a systemic level, the Justice Department's new FOIA.gov is a vast improvement. We hope it grows into a more robust system so the public can view past requests and responses agencies can better manage caseloads, and we all can track in real time the backlogs and whether agencies are staying ahead rather than falling behind. Mexico has such a system, and it makes perfect sense for the U.S. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Fitton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Cummings. We appreciate uh, the renewed focus on transparency by this committee. 
essential to Judicial Watch's anti-corruption and transparency mission is the Freedom of Information Act. We have nearly 17 years' experience in using FOIA to advance the public interest, and Judicial Watch is without a doubt the most active FOIA requester and litigator op operating today. The American people were promised a new era of transparency with the Obama administration. Unfortunately, this promise has not been kept. And to be clear, the Obama administration is less transparent than the Bush administration. We filed over 325 FOIA requests with the Obama administration, and we have filed 44 FOIA lawsuits to, against the administration to enforce FOIA law. Administratively, agencies created additional hurdles and stonewalled even the most basic FOIA requests during this administration. The Bush administration was tough and tricky, but the Obama administration is tougher and trickier. For instance, we recently asked the Transportation Security Administration for documents detailing passenger complaints about TSA pat-downs and, imag and imaging procedures at airports. The response, which is attached to my written testimony, TSA asked us to define what we meant by complaint. And once we are forced to go to Federal court, the Obama administration continues to fight us tooth and nail. The litigious approach to FOIA is exactly the same as the Bush administration's. So one can imagine the difficulties we encounter litigating these issues in court against the Obama Justice Department. Judicial Watch has been digging hard into the role, for instance, of uh, political corruption uh, and, and its impact on congressional oversight of Fannie and Freddie, uh, which collapsed in 2008. Uh, government has spent upwards of $153 billion on these entities, and they have taken complete control of them. We have asked for documents about political contributions. We have asked for other documents. The Administration's new position under the Federal High, uh, Housing and Finance Administration is that Fannie and Freddie are not agencies subject to FOIA, not one document those agencies have created over the time are subject to disclosure under the law, uh, which we believe is obviously uh, contrary to public interest and to the law. I can't quite fathom how this administration can laud a new era of transparency while over $1 trillion in government spending is shielded from practical oversight and scrutiny by the American people. And I am not only talking about FHFA on that and Fannie and Freddie, I am talking about the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, uh, all, all the agencies involved in the uh, bailouts. This government is growing by leaps and bounds, for better or for worse, and FOIA and transparency are simply not keeping up. This committee might also be interested to learn the truth about be, uh, behind the Obama White House's repeated trumpeting of the release of uh, Secret Service White House logs. In fact, the Obama administration is refusing to release tens of thousands of visitor logs and insists repeating a Bush administration last-ditch legal effort that the visitor logs are not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Secret Service is part of the Department of Homeland Security. They create the logs. It is obvious they are subject to FOIA. So while the Obama administration's attempts to take the high ground by voluntary, voluntarily disclosing them, it shields tens of thousands of others from public disclosure in defiance of FOIA law. You know, back in fall of 2009, we were invited by the Obama White House to visit to talk about this very issue. And we were told by then Special Counsel to the President, uh, Norm Eisen, who was uh, in charge of these issues, uh, you know, will you please publicly praise our transparency efforts? It will be good for you. It will be good for the Obama administration. But, of course, they didn't want to release these records to us as they required to under law, so we filed a lawsuit. So don't invite us to your office. You never know what's going to happen. To date, every court has reached, that has reached this issue, there have been four court decisions that have said these records are subject to FOIA. We even got these records under FOIA from the Bush administration. And now we know from published reports that White House officials have been meeting with lobbyists and interest is at, at a nearby Caribou coffee shop across the street to avoid their trumpeted voluntary disclosure of logs. They don't want these people visiting the White House so they meet them elsewhere because they don't want to tell the American people who they are visiting with. You know, we have asked for records about the Obamacare waivers, months, not one document. Uh, we asked for records about that illegal alien who has allegedly uh, uh, killed a nun in a drunk driving incident. Final report last fall. We asked for the final report. We sued. They said to give it to us in a week. Then they told us in the court, well, that final report is a draft report. You can't get the draft report. We are still working on the final report. We just got the final report. It was dated November 24th. So they told us they were working on a final report that had been dated three months previously. So this is the sort of gamesmanship and, and frankly, only a government uh, a political appointee would be uh, come up with that sort of uh, craziness in terms of FOIA responses. 
Uh, you know, in Exhibit B, I, I draw your attention briefly at the end to Exhibit B. We asked for the FBI file of Ted Kennedy. It took us four iterations to get the final file. In the end, they were proposing, uh, and we fought back and successfully uncovered, uh, to secure as national security information a comment from 40 years ago by a State Department official that Ted Kennedy was a brat. So, you know, it shows that the FBI is not above politics in, in how it evaluates what to release to the American people. And you can imagine why they'd be hesitant to release this information. So generally, and I want to, and I want to as, as a frequent requester and litigator of Judicial Watch, the Obama administration deserves a failing rate on transparency. This government is too big and they are not as concerned as they should be about the transparency with the extra work our government is doing. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I am sure I was a brat 30 to 40 years ago. I am sure we all were. <laughs> Ms. Canterbury. It is not, not a national it's, security It won't issue. be for me. <laughs> Ms. Canterbury. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I am the Director of the uh, Public Policy at the Project on Government Oversight, or POGO, which is an independent, nonpartisan watchdog uh, that champions good government reforms. It is a particular pleasure to be with you here today uh, to uh, talk about FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, which for nearly 45 years has been a cornerstone for our democracy and for open government. Um, on day one, uh, President Obama committed to creating an unprecedented level of openness in government. Uh, this administration certainly has put uh, unprecedented energy into this goal. Uh, but how is the government doing? Uh, well, it takes time to build an openness infrastructure and change a culture resistant to change and scrutiny. If the measure is proactive disclosure of information, then there have been leaps in innovations. Just this week, the administration launched FOIA.gov, which has terrific potential for improving public access to information like data.gov, recovery.gov, and usaspending.gov. However, if FOIA is the yardstick for openness, then we haven't gotten very far yet. Some mixed but overall disappointing reviews were delivered this week through two independent studies. The Knight survey found that the number of agencies that made concrete FOIA reforms jumped from 13 in 2009 to 49 in 2010. However, they included 90 agencies in their survey, and 17 were still working on the survey's FOIA request after 117 business days. Four did not even acknowledge that they had received a request. The new analysis from the Associated Press also yielded mixed results. Uh, on a positive note, both studies showed that the use of withholding for inter- and intra-agency um, information or Exemption 5 decreased, which the administration reported this week was a 26 percent drop last year. Uh, also, the administration noted that 93 percent of requests were released in full or part. However, the AP also noted that the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, cut its backlog by 40 percent in part by referring thousands of cases to the State Department. State ended up with a backlog twice as big as they had last year. Not only is this a shell game, but referrals are a major cause for delays. In sum, the overall picture does not look markedly better for FOIA operations, and the bottom line is, as Chief Justice Roberts recently acknowledged, there are a large number of FOIA requests, and quote, and it takes forever to get the documents, end quote. However, there are many ways in which this committee can improve the status quo through oversight and legislation. First, it is time for FOIA to move fully into the digital age, making most requests a relic of the past. A first step to better serve the public and save money over time would be to put online in a common database all FOIA logs, request tracking, and the responses. The guiding vision for the future should be making all public information available online in a timely manner. Secondly, we need better information on how FOIA is working. POGO supports the Faster FOIA Act, reintroduced by Senators Leahy and Cornyn this week, to create an independent, bipartisan body to study how to improve FOIA. In addition, we need to know more about who is re reviewing FOIA requests and why, and how this impacts disclosure. Chairman Issa is investigating possible political interference in FOIA at DHS. If founded, these issues are of great concern. FOIA should never be used for political purposes, and the identity or affiliation of a requester should never impact the response. POGO, however, is also concerned with the involvement of government contractors in FOIA at DHS 
and at other agencies, as well as the interference with IG independence, all of which should be examined and perhaps independently investigated. Third, this committee should take a closer look at statutory exemptions gone wild. POGO has long been concerned about the proliferation and scope of these statutory exemptions, or B3s, as well as the lack of oversight. Last year, POGO helped to repeal an extremely broad statutory exemption, along with the chairman and the ranking member for the SEC that was enacted in Dodd-Frank Bill, the Financial Reform Act. The controversy and ultimate repeal of the secrecy provision is Ill Ill illustrative of the potential dangers of statutory exemptions that sweep too broadly. Hopefully, it also serves as a cautionary tale to agencies that might seek unnecessary exemptions. Fourth, as proposals to replace the exemption thrown out by the Supreme Court surface, this committee must resist the pressure to substitute it outright. A thoughtful approach must be taken. If there is a demonstrated need to protect information that exi existing exemptions no longer cover, it must be very carefully considered. POGO hopes that you will be vigilant in balancing the public's right to know with other interests. Too often, overt secrecy has not only impaired the promise of FOIA, but also has put the American people at risk. Abuse of FOIA, overclassification, quasi-classification, and the suppression of whistleblowers are the most common tools for secrecy. In conclusion, while FOIA is the central mechanism for open government, there are several other open openness issues ripe for legislative reform, including um, the Transparency in Government Act introduced today by Ranking Member Cummings, which we support. Uh, lastly, to fulfill a pledge to America, this Congress must begin to proactively disclose congressional information, serving as a model for the new paradigm of FOIA. I thank you, and I look forward to the discussion and your questions. I thank you, and I was with you right up until that last part. <laughs> then it got a little confusing. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all. Your, uh, your statements were great, and obviously there is some additional material each of you will be placing in the record. I would now recognize myself for five minutes. And uh, I would begin on a sad note for all of you. The whistleblower, if you will, one of two people who voluntarily came in and were interviewed with a, an attorney for, from the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, had her title removed, her office changed, and her job responsibilities uh, uh, changed or eliminated the very next morning. So it is this committee's opinion, at least on the majority side, that this constitutes a demotion in violation of the spirit of the Whistleblower Act, and it is our intention to openly attempt to get her restated, reinstated and to deal with the politicization. And in this case, our investigation of the politi politicalization of FOIA requests by referring request and at least at the latest new stated truth, uh, and I always call it new stated truth because I wouldn't want to say someone lied, but their original truth was they didn't do it, then was they, they didn't do anything other than, than send them for information. We are now down to, well, they didn't delay them more than three days, and we have not yet gotten to exactly how much changes uh, or denials came as a result of sending completed, otherwise completed FOIA requests to political appointees. That is a disappointment that I wish I didn't have to bring up today. Uh, Ms. Nesbitt, I'm, I'm delighted to hear your testimony, but I am confused, and, and that happens a lot around here, particularly to me. But you said you have handled since September 2009, a little over a year, 541 cases. Our records show that, for example, in fiscal year 2009, there were only 500. This is old government. Right. Okay. But you you mediated 541. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Chairman, it is a little confusing when you start talking about those numbers. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we do this? For the but record, I, I'm happy to try and clarify well, as best well, I can. Since there's so little time, what I'd say is, for the record, would you clear up for our committee staff if you've processed 541 and in the entire FOIA statistics for the government for fiscal year 2009, there were only 557 received and 612,000 processed. So your number is substantially similar to the gross amount, and that we'd like to have that resolved for the record. Uh, uh, Mr. Fenton, yes. uh, I guess my question to you is, uh, 
if in addition to what you said if you would uh, if you would provide the committee with additional materials as to specific areas in which we could use our powers either through uh, cooperation or subpoena to get some of the information that you believe most should be brought to the attention of the Congress. It is not to be brought to you around litigation, but it is one in which we would be particularly interested in seeing what it is they are not showing you. And I appreciate if you do that for the record. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Canterbury, your organization has been extremely helpful to all of us, and I thank you for that. Uh, many of the organizations do a great deal here in, in Washington around the country. Yours has, uh, has been proactive in a way that, that we don't always appreciate what we do. Uh, I wanted to give you something for the record and ask you to, to give me your interpretation. Now, we do not make these public out of my office currently, but uh, it is a possibility that the, we would. My office receives 31,138 inquiries from constituents in calendar, calendar year to 2010, and we did that with one legislative respondent. They answered all of them. Uh, they centered around 300 major issues. Obviously, they are not all different. The Department of Justice receives 63,682. They used 425 full-time individuals uh, to do this work, costing a total of $60 million. My one person cost somewhat less. Would you, and I would ask each of you to respond, the, 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 the biggest thing that we think matters is that once you answer a question, you know that it should be answered for one, it should be answered for all. How much of that cost across government do you believe would be eliminated if in searchable data form every answer once given was made simultaneously available to anyone who wanted to search a database so that those questions would not come in again and take a plethora of study to give substantially the same information, depending upon how clever the questioner was versus the answer person? Well, certainly millions and um, billions, I would say, over time, very quickly it would add up to a huge amount of savings and, you know, allow the government to do other things. Okay, and I will take it in any order, but, Ms. Nesbitt, since you see so many of these, and obviously you saw cases in your 541 that were substantially the same as other cases, so you were arbitrating or mediating cases where the different people were asking for substantially the same information. Isn't that correct? Uh, well, certainly there are multiple requests from different requesters for the same kinds of records, um, and we would say uh, absolutely, it would be a, a, a great goal, and I think that there are people who are looking to do exactly as you suggest, which is to have one place where people can make requests, where they can track the responses to them, and ultimately all the, res the records that are released are available, easily searchable, so that people can see what is already out there. Anyone else want to comment on that, or something along those lines of, of the uh, consolidation of answers? I will just point out, Chairman Issa, that there is indeed a, an existing statutory mechanism. It is called the Frequently Requested Record provision that was added to the Act in 1996, subsection A2D. And seldom used. Well, and, but it provides for that type of thing with a numerical threshold that threshold being the first request is processed, records are disclosed, and then if the agency either believes or receives the two more requests are at hand, then it is obligated by law to make it affirmatively available. So there is a mechanism in the law that is at that number. Congress could, of course, lessen that number from two or three down to zero. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you um, started off uh, your questioning with some um, very strong allegations, and certainly if they were true, uh, this, is member, this is one member that would be uh, 100 percent with you. But I just want to, one of the things I said from the beginning um, when we first began this um, Congress is that we want to be fair to, to folks. I think we can put out allegations and they sit out there in the press uh, write them up, and then a lot of times the people, some things are cleared up later on, and still people are harmed, and I know that is not your intention. And so I would like to make two points about the letter you sent yesterday alleging retaliation against the DHS employee who was interviewed by our committee. 
uh, it appears there are two major factuals, factual inaccuracies in the letter. And uh, first, your letter asserted that this DHS employee was demoted. Uh, in fact, she had competed for a new senior executive service promotion, and she did not receive it. A panel of senior career and non-career employees conducted a detailed competitive process, and the person who was selected was better qualified, according to DHS, and we will you know, discover that later on, I am sure, and look into that. Committee staff were aware of this because they discussed it in several interviews they conducted with DHS employees. <clears throat> Second, your letter asserts that DHS employees uh, the DHS employee was demoted the day after she, was con she conducted her interview with the committee staff. This is also incorrect. Her interview with the committee was on March the 3rd. She was informed that she did not receive the SES promotion on January 10th, on January 10th, nearly two months earlier. Committee staff also knew this fact because they were told on a joint conference call with, with DHS the day before you sent your letter. Finally, as a result of these factual inaccuracies, your letter assumes conclusions that uh, are not supported by the actual evidence. In fact, they appear to be directly contradicted uh, to contradict the uh, information the committee has already collected. And despite the fact that the minority staff raised these concerns directly with your staff, you chose to send this an accurate letter anyway. And so I'm going to, since it is a letter to you and uh, this March 16th letter, uh, I am going to request unanimous consent that the DHS response to your letter, which was sent last night, be entered into the hearing record. I, I object based on the fact that we have not yet received that letter. No. Uh, we certainly would be happy when we receive the letter that uh, apparently the minority and the, uh, the administration wrote. We will look forward to seeing it when it arrives and then consider it. Thank you. Now, let me go to you, Mr. Metcalf. And I only say that, Mr. Chairman. I just want to, I think we, we have to be very careful when uh, these are people who, these are, you just complimented our public servants, and I, and I want to make sure that they are treated in a fair fashion. And I would, I would make that argument whether it was people on, employees on that side of the aisle or this side of the aisle, or no matter where they are. People are human beings, and they have to go back to their families and people look at this, they see it on C-SPAN, see their names in the Washington Post, and then if there is no clarification, it is just out there, it is just a headline, and that person can be ruined for the rest of their life without an ability to get a job or to accomplish very much of anything. And that is just something, I have seen that happen to too many people, and I just don't want it to happen to another human being, period. Mr. Metcalf, on September 23, 2010, President Obama addressed the United Nations General Assembly, and in his address he highlighted the importance of a world that fosters openness. This is what he said. The strongest foundation for human progress lies in open economies, open societies, and open governments. In all parts of the world, we see the promise of innovation to make government more open and accountable. And when we gather back here next year, we should bring specific commitments to promote transparency, to fight corruption, to energize civic engagement, to leverage new technology so that we strengthen the foundations of freedom in our own countries while living up to the ideals that can light the world. Mr. Kat Metcalf, in your experience, has any other American President done anything at this level to personally promote government openness on the world stage? No, uh, Congressman Cummings. As a matter of fact, I think it is fair to say that that action by President Obama is not only unprecedented, but it goes uh, much further than any other President has gone to be involved in fostering transparency internationally and promoting the U.S. leadership role in that area. Uh, not only did he do that in September, but he also in November last year, when in India, entered into a very explicit partnership with that nation aimed at fostering openness in government. Mr. Chairman, I ask for the one, one minute and 38 seconds that, of course. that, that you got. Um, Mr. Canterbury, Ms. Canterbury, Danielle Bryan, the executive director of your organization, uh, the Project uh, on Government Oversight, made this statement about President Obama's efforts. She said this, there is no question this is the first president in my experience who has personally elevated open government issues to the extent that, uh, that Obama has. Is that, are you familiar with that statement? 
Yes, I am, sir. Do you, do you I agree, would agree with, with your him. president? Yes. <laughs> Another one of your colleagues, Tom Blanton, is the director of the National Security Archive at George Washington University. This is what he said about the President's efforts. President Obama is the first President to invite transparency advocates into the Oval Office to talk about open government. In addition, uh, the organizers of the National Freedom of Information Day conference are giving President Obama an award this week to honor his deep commitment to an open and transparent government. But I want to be clear. Everyone I just quoted also believes much more can be done. And I want to make it clear that I believe much more can be done. Uh, our job is to promote these gains through continued oversight and to push even great, for even greater transparency measures in Congress. That is why today we introduced the Transparency and Openness in Government Act. Uh, Ms. Canterbury, our legislation consists of five bills that all, that all passed the House overwhelmingly with public, Republican and Democratic support uh, last session, but were not enacted. And I think I, I, th I, think I heard you say that you uh, support that legislation? Absolutely, sir, we do. Finally, I have about 15 seconds, Mr. Chairman. Do you think our committee should mark up this legislation at the next available opportunity? Yes. Uh, the gentleman's time actually is 32 over the additional time we gave you, but uh, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for everyone's edification, we are going to take one more, uh, one more question, round of questions this side. We will break, and then uh, Mr. Clay will be first up when we come back. We will be out for about 15 to 20 minutes. But as soon as somebody is back in the chair, we will start again. So don't go too far. Uh, Mr. Welber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that latitude. And uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here today and uh, expressing desire for sunlight. Uh, Mr. Bloom, let me, let me ask you, uh, you've, you've called the Obama administration's open government initiatives a, and I quote, roadmap for transparency. In your opinion, has that roadmap been effectively used by Federal agencies? Well, I think that, um, you know, oftentimes maps get lost, they get put on the car seat, you know, and the kid rips them up and, and or you, you stick them in a pocket and, it, and they are hard to find. I think that some agencies have that map and are following it, and I think some agencies don't know where the map is. And I think that you see that in some of the, you know, compliance uh, uh, statistics, um, and, and I think it's uh, it's all over the map. What are the what are the most egregious examples of agencies that have lost the map, used it for a litter box or whatever else? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to come up with specific examples, but I think that the the issues existed today, they existed yesterday, they existed in this administration, the last administration, and since the creation of the FOIA itself. It is the, the long delays. It is the, you know, we have one reporter that I know of who was working during Hurricane Katrina, literally in the floodwaters, trying to figure out the chemicals that were in those waters because his readers were asking him, can, I, can we come back? Can we come home? Can we start getting on with our lives? And he was trying to give them that answer. And through FOIA, he, he couldn't get an answer. In fact, he had uh, uh, actually moved because he had to evacuate, and he had let the agencies that he had requested information from that, here is my new address, send this information here, and they sent it back to his, the address of his destroyed home. Um, so it is really these longstanding problems. You know, Ms. Nisbet, OGIS should not have to remind agencies to return phone calls or to even pick up the phone. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fitton, um, your organization's website includes an archive of documents uh, you have received under, F, uh, under FOIA. You make these documents electronically available to any member of the public. Do you think the government should also provide electronic access to already released records? Yes, uh, but that only goes so far. My, con my concern is that these document dumps that the administration uh, is highlighting are documents that you largely can get if you know where to look otherwise and are not of matter of great public interest. You know, the FOIA fights we get into are matters of public controversy, and that is where the rubber meets the road on FOIA. If the agencies release information that may look, make them look bad or may highlight an issue they don't want to talk about. And on, on that issue, uh, that is where uh, we, we face the most resistance. And we appreciate the additional information on the Internet. The government is doing so much, the more on the Internet, the better. Uh, but on issues of political controversy or, or corruption allegations, or, 
Uh, you are not going to find that on the Internet. No agency is going to put it up there, nor I would think you would get a, sort of the email traffic, for instance, you would want about a specific decision. That is not necessarily going to be posted on the Internet. I don't know if it is a good idea to do that. Generally should they, I mean, should they be? I don't know. Does, do, do we think that government bureaucrats should post their emails almost immediately after sending them? Maybe. You know, the government is asking us to do a lot of things, requiring us to give them a lot of information, has a lot of control, um, uh, but the accountability is lacking, especially uh, given the uh, dramatic expansions of government we have seen recently. What are some, um, uh, if you have, uh, some examples of cooperative agencies and how they have worked uh, to meet not only in the uh, spirit of the law or the uh, rule of the law, but the, the spirit of the law, your well, requests? I mean, the, the letter of the law is almost never filed, followed. Um, the State Department is an interesting agency. They take forever to give you a response, but the response they give you is usually something you are asking for. Uh, the Department of Justice is terrible. Uh, as I said in my testimony, the financial agencies are the worst. The Treasury Department is, is probably the worst in our experience, which is the most troubling given, given the financial crises we have gone through and, and all the decisions that have been made related to the spending of our money uh, to the tune of a trillion dollars or so that have gone through Treasury and other related agencies. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. And uh, as, as we take a 20-minute recess, uh, note to the ranking member that uh, by unanimous consent, I would ask that both yours and the corresponding letters be placed in the record, along with any additional uh, supplementals you might want to put in, so there may be a complete review of, of what, quite frankly, is a disagreement about somebody getting a demotion, but more importantly, of interest to all the people who are testifying here today. I thank the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We stand in recess until five minutes after the completion of the last vote, uh, which I will ask to have posted on the monitor so that you will know when we are done. We stand recessed.